first, uh, again, let me thank uh, Professor Davis for that, for the invitation to come, um, and and for that wonderful introduction. Um, you know, you write and you sort of, uh, it, it's like sending a note out somewhere, and you hope that that note will be heard and understood. And um, so I feel, I feel in her introduction that, uh, that, that, that the letter that I sent was received. Uh, and, and thank you for, for receiving it. I also want to thank Diana Messiah, who um, we know each other from long. And uh, this is a wonderful gift that you've given this center, and I'm happy to be its third uh, speaker. Um, so lots of love to you. Um, thank you to Camilla Bonifaz also for um, administering me through it. Uh, and uh, congratulations to Savitri for, um, for that recognition, uh, for your work, and I wish you the best with its success. Now, before I begin, I want to say uh, thank you to three more people. Namely, um, uh, Dr. Leslie Sanders and Dr. Ronaldo Walcott. Uh, this paper came out, uh, part of this paper came out of a, a, an interview we tried to do together that, that was always unsuccessful. <laughs> um, and then finally I sort of grabbed it from both of them and said, oh, just give me that. I don't like how it's looking. So, so, and, it, and it's become part of the discourse. Uh, that I'm trying to work out, the kind of, some problem I'm trying to work out. And uh, thirdly, to Professor Christina Sharp uh, from um, Tufts University, but who's uh, visiting um, intimately and pleasantly, uh, and um, for her help on, uh, that she's going to help me out. <laughs> so, Clicking. <laughs> what has to be done throughout this, this talk? So, uh, so my talk is called The Language of the Blue Flirk. And this is a brief consideration. Oh, before I, 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 as I was writing the talk, I thought, what are you writing, Dion? This is like you're writing some Fidel speech or something. Because I, think, <laughs> I think this is going to take a while. But, I'll, you know, so I'm just warning you up ahead. Um, so, why I call this talk the language of the blue cloak will become apparent. This is a brief consideration of poetry's diacritical possibilities for existence, for being in the diaspora. It is a partial look at poetry's capacities for supplementing and overwriting the inadequacies of the language of non-being in the diaspora. As I speak to you, I am also trying to think my own way through these possibilities. This consideration, therefore, is, it also performs uh, or enacts um, several acts of reading and writing, the very acts of reading and writing that I'm trying to illuminate. At a moment when I think narrative is incapable of transmitting the tomorrow of struggle, the futurity of freedom from brutality, when narrative envelops such futurity in oppressive language. Poetry, I think, offers a vocabulary as well as a hermeneutic, a way of depositing and unearthing plural meanings toward a description of being in the diaspora. Poetry presents as a diacritical to narrative and a diacritical to what Professor Sharp has called the orthographies of the wake. In an unpublished work um, called In the Wake on Blackness and Me, Professor Sharp talks about uh, these orthographies of the wake the ways of speak, speaking blackness into the world at present. 
um, that she says, and I quote, that set of quotidian catastrophic events and their reporting, the dysgraphia of disaster, arriving by way of rapid, deliberate, repetitive, and wide circulation on television, in social media, and newspapers, that whole production of representation of black social material and psychic death. This is what she calls the orthographies of the way. And these orthographies, this dysgraphia, makes domination invisible and not visceral." Unquote. I propose that the dysgraphia, the inability of dominating narratives to write or includes unwillingly and unknowingly the various attempts at response to the disaster by those of us who write against and in opposition to it, since our responses, these responses, often inadvertently appeal to and in the language of the dysgraphia. I see narrative as almost always implicated in the colonial imperialist project. In its best efforts, or in our best efforts, we write back to or against first the existence and then the persistence of the dominant narratives of coloniality and imperialism. Character and landscape in narrative, in this sense, are weighted with whiteness as the seminal category. And the black body in narrative is always, therefore, spectacular, always spectacularized, always marked. I'll just give you a, a small example of something. So I, I wrote a, a, a bit of work uh, where I did not mock my character as black. And my character was misrecognized as white, simply because of, the, of not marking that body. Yeah, but merely marking the body as human, the body is assumed to be white. Yeah? I offer poetry's diacritical as a remedy, a fragmentation, an interrogation, and a critique of narrative, whose modes of writing, modes of reading, and modes of speaking apply raced language to black presence and black presence, in which being in the diaspora, being in history, is represented as excess. So predicated, this narrative language commands us to answer in the same language, struck through, enlivened by the action of our bodies in race. Our bodies are always active, always enacting in the register of this narrative, or in the register of what I call in Land to Light On, the hard gossip of race that inhabits this world. And we are fluent in that language. We often respond in it, taking apart the attacks of race to language by employing the very dysgraphia. It is our fluency in this race language that makes us so alarmed when our iterations are not heeded or understood. We say, what do you mean? Didn't we say that? <laughs> yes. Um, all the time we are yearning after our dying language of liberation, which recedes and recedes. Our dying language of futurity that must wait and wait as we try to renovate narratives of coloniality and imperialism, of provisional living and half living. We live instead in a language of convenience, of instrumentation. We are people without a translator. We precede our lives and submit the text to the dominant culture for inclusion. Let me say that again. We precede our lives and submit the dominant text, and submit the text to the dominant culture for inclusion. The language already contains our demise, and any response contains that demise, as each response emboldens and strengthens the language it hopes to undermine. It is always as if we will live tomorrow, live only, live when, live if. The apprehension of neverness we experience, of presentness in another world. This chasm between ourselves 
and ourselves. Poetry's hermeneutic allows, perhaps, breaks open, explodes the language of race power, the language in which we work, where whiteness is the human. By poetry's diacritic, and I'm using diacritical in this grammatical sense here, the way diacritical marks supplement certain alphabets of, of various languages we work in. Changing uh, the sound, the way diacritical marks change the sound or the tone or the meaning of certain words. I mean that the alphabet of the language we work in is incapable of and inadequate for registering the sounds of living, living in the diaspora, inadequate for the sounds of the always possible world's faces one lives. This alphabet is absolutely capable of registering the sound of dying in the diaspora, of provisional living, and of half-living. Poetry's gifts of multiple and new meaning might trouble this dysgraphia. The poem is concerned formally with the qualities of time, materiality, and meaning, and has no obligation or need to attend to linearity or the representative, as is often the burden of prose narrative. There's no preeminent or presumptive compulsion to construct a world within which character moves and is acted upon. No obligation except simply to address the reader, not even to answer the reader. Story cannot account for existence in our case, at least not story in this grammar. Other questions arise from a poem. Whenness, howness, whatness. What do we need language to do now? What might language be capable of if we think in it differently? Verse 01. I've begun to kind of think about that. This is a writing is a negotiation between what is said and what is unsaid, between what is written and what is withheld. What is withheld is on the left-hand page. And so these are left-hand pages. The moment they are written, they will not exist. That is, they will not exist as themselves, as they were first conceived. What is withheld is on the back of a leaf. I have withheld more than I have written, and I have restrained more than I have given. I have left unsaid more than I have said. I have withheld much more than I have withheld. Even these pages have already created their own left-hand pages, as will be seen. I will have added for clarification or withdrawn some detail. I will have paused the structure of the sentence and the meaning of the sentence and reformulated it to resolve some understanding that was tentative in the first place, but that merely for the sake of agreeing to a rule of syntax, I have to present as certain. Moreover, I will have cleaned out all of my doubt and all of my prevarication and all of my timidity. The left-hand page is a recursive page. Each verse becomes a rector as soon as the ink and paper are applied. Each left-hand page generates one right-hand page and an infinite number of left-handed pages. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what is withheld always multiplies. Yeah? So that, going back to that notion of pre-seeing oneself into the, the dominant narrative. Yeah? The left-hand pages accumulate with more speed and intensity than the right-hand pages. They are chronic. That is to say, they are always present, occurring, intrinsic, and incurable, and unfailing and uneasy, like freight. The freight of withholding gathered over years. Like I can well imagine there's so many left-hand pages in this room. There's so much withholding, yeah, given the histories that are in the room. The freight of withholding gathered over years becomes heavier and heavier, infinite and unbound weight. There are bales of paper on a wharf somewhere, at a port somewhere. There is a clerk inspecting and inspecting them. She is the blue clerk. 
And I'm, I'm suggesting each one of you has a blue skirt. She's dressed in a blue ink coat. Her right hand is dry, her left hand is dripping. She's expecting a ship, she's preparing for one. But she's afraid that by the time the ship arrives, the stowage would have overtaken the war. The sea off the port is roiling some days, calm some days. Up and down the wharf, she examines the bales, ships old left-hand pages to the back, making room for the swift, voluminous, incoming freight. The clerk looks out sometimes over the roiling sea or over the calm sea, finding the horizon, seeking the transfiguration of a ship. The bales have been piling up for years, yet they look brightly scored, crisp and sharp, they have abilities the clerk is forever curtailing and marshalling. They are stacked deep and high, and the clerk in her inky garment weaves in and out of them, checking and rechecking, that they do not find their way into the right-hand page. She scrutinizes the manifest hourly, the contents and the sequence of loading. She keeps account of cubic meters of senses, perceptions, and resistant facts. No one need be aware of these. No one is likely to understand some of these are quite dangerous, and some of them are too delicate and beautiful for the present world. There are green, unclassified aphids, for example, living with these papers. The sky over the wharf is a sometimes sky. It changes with the moods and anxieties of the clerk. It is ink blue as her coat, or gray as the sea, or pink as the evening clouds. The sun is like a red wasp that flies in and out of the clerk's ear. It escapes the clerk's flapping arms. The clerk would like a cool room. But all the weather depends on the left-hand pages, all the acridity in the salt air, all the waft of almonds and seaweed, all the sharp poisonous odor of time. The left-hand pages swell like doom some years. It is all the clerk can do to mount them with the theodolite to survey their divergent lines of intention. These dunes would envelop her as well as the world if she were not the ink-drenched clerk. Some years, the acridity of the left-hand pages makes the air dusty, parches the hand of the clerk, the dock is then a desert, the bales turn to sand, and then the clerk must arrange each grain in the correct order, humidify them with her breath, and wait for the season to pass. And some years, the pages absorb all the water in the air, becoming like freaks, and the clerk's garments sweep sodden through the veils, and the clerk weeps and wonders, why is she here, and when will the ship arrive? I am the clerk, overwhelmed by the left-handed pages. Each blooming choir contains a thought selected out of many reams of thoughts and vetted by the clerk, then presented to the author. The clerk replaces the file, which has grown to a size unimaginable. I am the author, in charge of the ink-stained clerk, facing the dog. I recall the right-hand page. I do nothing, really, because what I do is clean. I forget the bales of paper fastened to the dock, and the weather doesn't bother me. I choose the presentable things, the beautiful things, and I enjoy them sometimes if not for the clerk. The clerk has the worry and the damp thoughts and the arid thoughts. The clerk goes balancing the newly withheld pages across the ink slippery dock. She throws an eye on the still sea. The weather is concrete today. Her garment is stiff like marl today. When Borges says he remembers his father's library in Buenos Aires, the gaslight, the shelves, and the voice of his father reciting Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. I recall the library at the roundabout on Harris Promenade, San Fernando. The library near the Metro Cinema and the Woolworth Store. But to go back, first, when my eyes hit on Borges' dissertation on poetry, I thought, I had no library. And I thought it with my usual melancholy. And next, my usual pride in being without. And the first image that came to me after that was my grandfather's face. 
with his spectacles and his weeping left eye and his white shirt and his dark trousers and his newspapers and his mustache and the clips around his shirt arms and his notebooks and his law books. And at the same moment that the melancholy came, it was quickly brushed away by the thought that he was my library. In his notebooks, my grandfather logged hundredweight of copra, pounds of chick feed and manure, the health of horses, the nails for their iron shoes, the acreages of heliconia and yams, the depth of two rivers, the length of one rainy season. Then I returned to the Harris Promenade and the white library with wide steps, but when I inquired, there was no white library with wide steps. They tell me, but an ochre library at a corner, an ochre library with great steps leading up. What made me think it was a white library? The St. Paul's Anglican Church anchoring the promenade, the colonial white courthouse, the gray white public hospital overlooking the sea. I borrowed a book at that white library, even though the library, as I imagined it now, did not exist. A book by Gerald Durrell, namely My Family and Other Animals. I don't remember any other books I brought home, though I remember a feeling of quiet luxury and a desire for spectacles to seem as intelligent as my grandfather. And I read here, too, in this white library, a scrap about Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, though only the kind of scrap, the kind of refuse or onion skin they give school children in colonial countries about a strange skinny man on a horse with a round sidekick. The Oka Library on Harry's Promenade was at the spot that was called Library Corner, and it used to be very difficult to get to because of the traffic and the narrow sidewalk. But I was agile and small, and I thought I was ascending a wide, white step library, and I remember the square clock adjacent to the roundabout. My grandfather, with his logs and notebooks, lived in a town by the sea. That sea was like a liquid page to the left of the office, where my grandfather kept his logs and his notebooks with their accounts. Apart from the depth of two rivers, namely the iguana and the pilot, he also noted the tides and the times of their rising and falling, and the rain, the number of inches, and its absence. He needed to know about the rain for planting and for sunning and drying the copra. And too, he kept a log of the sun, where it would be and what hour, and its angle to the earth and in what season. And come to think of it, he must have logged the clouds moving in. He said that the rain always came in from the sea, the clouds moving in were a constant worry. I remember the rain sweeping in, pelting down like stones. That is how it used to be said, the rain is pelting down like stones. He filled many log books with rain and its types, showers, sprinkles, deluges, slanted boulders, sheets, needles, slivers, peppers, cumulonimbus clouds, or nimbostratus clouds, convection rain and relief rain. Relief rain, he wrote in his log book, in his small office. And the rain came in from the sea like pepper, then pebbles, then boulders. It drove into his window and disturbed his log with its wind, and it wet his desk. And he or someone else would say, but look at the rain. And someone else would say, see what the rain do, as if the rain were human. Or they would say, don't let that rain come in here as if the rain were a creature. Anyway, my grandfather had a full and thorough record of clouds and their seasons and their violence. From under the sea, a liquid hand would turn a liquid page each second. This page would make its way to the shore and make its way back. Sometimes pens would wash up onto the beach, long-stemmed organic style. We call them pens what tree or plant or reef they came from, we did not know. But some days, the beach at Guaya would be full of these study. Just as some nights, the beach would be full of blue crabs, which reminds me now of Garcia Marquez's old man with wings, 
but didn't then, as I did not know Garcia Marquez then, and our blue crabs had nothing to do with him. It is only now that the crabs in his story have overwhelmed my memory. It is only now that my blue night crabs have overwhelmed his story. Anyway, we would take these pens and sign our names and the names of those we loved along the length of the beach. Of course, these names rubbed out quickly and as fast we would write them and self consume them. What does this have to do with Borges? Nothing at all. That is not what you meant to say, the clerk says, finally. I walked into the library and it was raining rain and my grandfather's logs were there and the wooden window was open. As soon as I opened the door, down the white steps came the deluge. If I could not read, I would have drowned. Now you are sounding like me, the clerk says. I am you, the author says. If this is the space of the poet, the space that cuts through coloniality, then what must the language be? What is the language that describes this space? That language that does not take the address to the canon as its motivation. By that I mean it has no obligation to verify its legitimacy or existence through the various ways one, the author, strives for this legitimacy by constantly making reference to 18th and 19th century English literature and by constantly referring to the enlightenment's marking of the black body in an attempt to receive or procure a judgment of human on that body. The assignment of the poet is multiple. To bring that black body into focus in itself, for itself. A language for recording the space-time of that body. The diacritical is then a diagnostic, a way of reading the body. And here I'm borrowing or paraphrasing a little bit on Richard Kearney's work uh, on the diacritical and the community. Not only in its illness, this diagnosis, but in its health. While the dysgraphia speaks of its fragmentation, poetry has the capacity to speak of this body's presentness, of its integrity. This is from Osiri uh, Seven. Which is a piece about thinking about um, Bird and Coltrane and Monk as theoretical. So you don't have to read it, just let it pass over you as we go. To furrow, to make a row, to make a file, to make a line, to make an inventory. The clerk is at the end of the wharf. The weather is as aggressive as a metaphor. The metaphor, she's talking to herself clearly, the metaphor is an aggressive attempt at clarity, not secrecy. The poem addresses the reader, it asks the first question. It is not interested in the reader's comfort or discomfort or a narrative solution. It is not interested in your emotional expectations or chronologies. It is flooded with the world. The great interrogation room is the stanza. You are standing at its door. The clerk is at the end of the wharf. At the end, the weather is as aggressive as a strophe. The strophe is a turning, and a turning, and a resolute turning, after and after and after the world is different, and after and still. The clerk is the excess of the excess. I am so simple an idea, she says. It is very complicated. We are working with something that has already been concluded. It is not necessary to experience this body in order to know it. It is conceived of before it appears or is investigated. I, of course, can never make such a mistake. That would be fatal. The author has heard this dissertation from the clerk, but is intrigued by the former sentence about the simple idea and its complication. When I say simple, the clerk knows the author's penchant for first sentences. I mean it already exists, that definition, that place you are so eager to live in. Must I be explicit, the human? It exists in the world, but it is occupied. The author, of course, is downcast. Her instruments by her indolence aside, the wires come awake. 
the one she is looking for. Pain with no wires, she manages with great care to lift a page without rearranging its contents. The clerk's face must remain indelible for this task. The page is without verbs. It is a page she intends to give to the author as a kind of bomb. This page has small magical powers of the same type the clerk believes as, say, the situation where poison is medicine, an anti-venom. Without verb, nothing can be done. Nothing can get in the bloodstream. There's lemongrass in it, if you like. There's bitter bark, but the page is birdless and worldless. And there's a grand arithmetic and magnetic embryos and latitudes of where and where and where. Imagine the tenderness she must use, the held breath of the sea, the still dark, the tremulous veils alert, transfixed, the slight flap of the leaf, her watchful hand. Do you know the butchery it requires to skim the vocal tract for the soft, perfumed sliver of an H? Try them there. A lot of work. <laughs> It's a lot of work. The velar K, the bilabial P, then to circumlocute the corona of the tongue for T and the and S. That is the clerk's job. And then, with the same professional alacrity of a slaughterer, to apprehend the constituting words and sift these for the unchastened perceptions, the incurable knowledges of who we are. The withholding pages, all their interests and their cynicisms, the volumetric capacity worries her. The clerk examines the useless curses, the stray sentences on why a life must be lived. She hurries back to the estuary and the disarticulating author. She lives in the accretion of the author's dreams. The author lives on the aggregate of the clerk's senses. I am writing my way out of a nightmare, the author says. I am caught in a nightmare, the clerk says. Everyone knows how things get done in the world. The author is ready with excuses. The clerk turns to the author, and the clerk's face is flooded with life. I don't. I don't know at all. I only know what a, what a liquid consonant can do. The clerk is inclined not to trust the author with this page, but the page has its own poison or medicine. The verbless page leaves the author's, the clerk's fingers, floats down on the author's hands. So this was my attempt to write without a verb. It turned out okay, I think. You see, like this, this bedding, this mercy, this stretcher, this solitary, perfectible strangeness and edge, such cloth, this compass of mine, of her. Of more. It makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> we could, in fact, just start speaking like that. That would cut a whole bunch of stuff off. <laughs> a whole set of arguments are cut off. <laughs> the multiplications of which, the enormity of this, and drill bits and hammers, and again handcuffs, and again roll, force business. And then signs, all signs, all the way. This is from Austria 1. Blue arrivals, blue tremors, blue position, blue superation. The clerk is considering blue habits, blue thousands, blue shoulder. Where these arrive from, blue expenses. The clerk is humming in her ears, blue hand, and she answers. Any blue, she asks the author. Any blue nails today? Did you send me, as I asked, blue ants? The author asks, blue drafts, perhaps blue virus, blue traffic would make a sense, said the clerk. Blue hinges, blue climbing. This would go together under normal circumstances. The author actually doesn't hear a thing, the blue clerk says, under these circumstances when the blue clerk sits in the blue clerk's place, making the blue clerk's language. Systolic blue, any day will be blue now, reloading blue, blue disciplines. The blue clerk will like a blue language, or a lemon language, or a violet language. Blue arrivals. Oh, yes. Uh, this is a quote from Kamal Bradley. Not that. <laughs> and in the warped, fantastic environment of our lives, for instance, 
None of us had seen the outer world. We were the offspring of lovers, convicts, the poor, and had been brought to this forest by the factory committee." Unquote. It is here in the Black Angel. Do you know that text? No? What, what, what's it from again? Uh, from Dream Stories. Uh, that is a short piece for the Black Angel. It is here in the Black Angel. I love that line in the warped, fantastic environment of our lives. So it's beautifully laid. It is here in the Black Angel that everything is said already, everything that can be said. The author said, how much you owe him, and more, green life and green balance. The clerk goes on, black arrivals, oh yes, black valves of black engines, black charges, black spins, black numbers, black options, black equilibriums. Now you owe him the warped, fantastic environment of our lives and none of us had seen the outer world. Well, I owe so much. And yes, the world I live in is not the world at all. It is, if I ever look at it, as a place, somewhere where the years I manage to live will not be enough for me to live. I will have spent the years I live in this war. Venus by um, John Coltrane. And when I was writing Osiris, I worked at listening to Venus, listening to Venus as structure for working the poem. relationship to the tercets that I, that I wrote and the way of kind of thinking of Coltrane's of that piece as as a structure and as theory and, and and trying to write that theory if you will. Because I think that you know people like Coltrane and Bird and Monk give us a theory. Yeah? Give us a, a way of structuring language um, that is really, really quite interesting and and much further out theoretically than any theory that we read as words uh, outside. So they, they give us a kind of diacritical of, the, of, of contemporary life. It's, uh, and, and more, uh, you listen to, to that piece um, by Coltrane, and it is as if you are, you are in 2517 listening to a piece, listening to a message sent from, uh, from uh, people who were um, strapped down by their time, but their language ranged outside of the time that they, their bodies were. And I think that is true of living in the diaspora, that one's body is lodged in, in, a, in a particular physical space, but one's sensibilities have surpassed that space. Um, incredibly, right? So anyway, all of that. So uh, in Venus, um, there are two basic elements, the author says, horns and the drums. They are working with doubleness all the time. There is one statement at the top that, da -da -da -da, that bad singer, but forgive me, Coltrane. And then they begin to deconstruct the statement. The drum serves as the pacing for the horn, but it has its own investment in the statement. So it holds underneath, but its own project is also to find deconstructions. The drums played by Rashid Ali structure the horn as in, and is in turn structured by the horn. Coltrane works on the first declarative syntactical unit. It is not declarative, the clerk interjects. It is provisional, speculative. Let us at least try to be as precise as we can. 
since Fine, says the author, he works on deconstructing that speculative provisional statement structurally and breaks it down technically. What is done becomes undone. And then he also deconstructs its emotion. If you listen to it, it is romantic but mournful, sophisticated and worldly, it is elegant. And he pulls these notions apart. Also, he tears the elegance to its limits. He mocks the mournfulness as not mournful enough. And he drives the otherworldliness to its outer worldliness. To my way of seeing, said the clerk, it is more elegant when it is, as you say, torn apart. So both emotionally and structurally, the author continues ignoring the clerk's interruption, hearing it only as a faint sound from the clerk. He pulls the statement apart. There's a point in the middle, four or five minutes of it, where the project takes hold of him, where the music is fully realized as separate and sentient on its own. There is an uncontrollability to it. And you can hear it wobbling out, 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 into distances and into a kind of unspeakable, at least in your language, the clerk objects. The former statement tries to return, to recover itself, to recover that line, and it can't. So much structural and emotional change has already been accomplished. Happened, you mean, says the clerk. So much has happened, says the author, that the statement itself is now indescribable without its fragmentations. It rejects its former self as well as it accepts that somehow that self, like a shadow, is embedded in it, in him, at that moment of complete disintegration. To me, this is like our poem, Osiris. The tercets are like Rashid Ali's drums, consistent, sheltering, pushing, the three lines are completely steady. They perform a range of acts of pacing. The tercet is conducting the ideas, the horn, the osuries. You know nothing about musical structure, the clerk says, but I can hear, the author says. I hear it as a liberatory rhetoric. Then should I be still here on the dock, says the clerk rhetorically. Shouldn't the ship have arrived? Shouldn't this shoreline disappear? The author ignores her, the bitter edgedness, the global violence, her own violence, the tercet anchors. What disrupts the tercet is meaning. It is not regulated by rhyme or equal metric length of line, but by the sense of infinity or possibility in between this. It is indivisible by anything other than itself. It is light. It can hold weight and surprise. But if I haven't said it, this already, you have said it ad infinitum, one was the clerk, tripping along giddily like a tercet. The tercet has guile, like the body of a snake. Or on the other hand, a triangle, or less ambitious, the clerk joins, but more cunning, a bit of elastic. I could use a bit of elastic. The next time you come by, I would dye it blue, like this paper. Only a small bit of elastic, the clerk says, but the author is drifting. When I was trying to write the first bones emerged from the human zoos of the 18th century, 18, the clerk says, more like 15. Columbus arrived in Seville in 1493 with eight Taino and Merindians kidnapped from Hispaniola. They become an adjective and lose their nounness. I think the human zoos simply got larger. They did not disappear. I was trying to write when I noticed that I too live in this modern zoo and reenact each day a certain set of arguments. And suddenly being aware of the elaborate performance, I no longer wanted to be part of those performances or thought it worth noting that those were performances and that they were horrendous. Those performances have used up generations of people like a play being acted and reenacted over time. The actors losing skin and bone, dying and being born again inadvertently to perform afresh these roles. All of my births and deaths, all of our births and deaths. I leave my house and immediately my body is ripped from me to enact. And resistance and rebellion and war have somehow been part of these performances too. I'm a watcher of the zoo, the author says, as well as a performer the snide clerk interject. This kind of language, even the language that we use to combat the more awful ailments, even that can be turned inward on itself, to transgress, to rebel, to revolt. When you really take apart a word like transgressive, what do you mean? 
It is a deeply Christian. It is deeply Christian. It capitulates to the existence of a law, a truth, which you are then said to have crossed. So you are dying in this world's etymology. And these languages are at the core, a construction of the Sioux, a dialect. Each word that seems perfectly legitimate right now, perfectly, as the vocabulary of what we call resistance, you will notice later, only reinforces the zoo. Back to Coltrane. Of course, I would like to go back to him, the clerk hummed. The poet's position is only to point out that, not to say how we should go forward with it, but just to point out that all these laws so far ever address one arm or one foot over the long term. They address one leg, one mouth, where one can sit, where one can eat, where one can travel, and so on. They leave us perhaps just one-legged and one-footed, one-armed, sewing our vaginas, clawing our faces, cursing the presence of our bare heads. I do know that the bodies that we inhabit now are corpses of the humanist narrative. And when we appear on the street, that is what we are appearing as. So I can only give you this view of it. We inhabit these bags of muscle and fat and bones that are utilized in the humanist narrative to demonstrate the incremental ethical development of a certain subject who is not me. We leave the psychiatrist's office like the figure in Remedios Vado's painting Psychoanalista with a little container of our true possible selves held out at arm's length in a plastic bag. My job is to notice, even as you are living a living object of dead bones, you can notice. You can't sustain that double scene for very long, otherwise the body will truly collapse. The 19th century human zoos, that is when I left you, the clerk says. That is when I created you, the author says. That is when I created you, the clerk says. That is when you left me, the author says. It is a short step away from how we perform these bodies in the present. You are exaggerating. And even look at the sky, the clerk beckons. You are living your life. Don't be naturalistic, the clerk says. Where is the great Arctic? The endless dark days, the endless daylit nights. However, if you want to stop for a minute and observe yourself, you are merely the container for a set of cultural knowledges and practices which go on without you, but which you are never without. They are like a bag, a heavy bag on you. How do I get out of this zoo? Two enigmatic bales arrived one day. The clerk was adding up the countervailing duty as she usually did on Mondays. Mondays, because Sundays are a bad time for the author. Just the sound of Billy Holiday alone accounts for this. So this surprising Monday when the clerk was ex had expected the usual empty Monday of additions, two bales, one violet, and one blue arrived. The blue was not like the blue of the clerk's garment, rather. It was like a blue, like the blue of whole fast bay on the Indian Ocean. The violet was indescribable. How can you describe violet? It melts. Violet rails, violet cancels, violet management, violet maintenance, the violet veil began. Blue search, blue proceedings, blue diastole, blue traffic, the blue, blue began. Lighter than usual, the clerk tried to figure out what to make of these. Adjectiveness, the clerk thinks balance, daily, ink, perhaps, sincerely, dear, file 65, attempt 197. The clerk needs a spanner, a vehicle, a bowl of nails, a wire, a copper lamp, a lamp. Bring file 267, attempt 501, handles. Have you seen these, said the clerk? Some years ago, you collected them. They are rich with something. I don't know what. Of course, I'm being poor. You, as you say, live in place, but I live in time. What if you were to read these ads diacritically, not as a record of advertising for the recapture of fugitives from slavery, nor as a record of the barbarity and brutality of slavery itself, but as an image of the fugitive, a graph and an autobiography of the fugitive. Most complicatedly, since these ads were not paintings or graphs, I will show you that. So the clerk hands the author this thing, yeah? 
What if you were to read it more complicatedly? Since these ads were not paintings or graphs, nor were they autobiographical accounts, which would throw description, which would through description represent an image or a self-made narrative. They were descriptions, biographized by barbarous inca barbarous incarcerators of the people who had fled captivity. They were descriptions by people who would have generally and ordinarily represented the fugitives without any descriptors that we would call individual. Who would normally have described them without individual features, without individual tastes, without individual characteristics or affects that bore any resemblance to a sentient, viable, recognizable person? In fact, the emoticon of the dark figure in a gesture of fleeing that sometimes attended ads for fugitives from slavery served as sign for their general category, their undifferentiated state. But hunting down, pursuing, recapturing the fugitives in order to re-enslave them required a strange feat of personifying, of biographizing. The fugitive had to be accurately described as a viable, recognizable, sentient person, i.e. a person in freedom, a person with tastes, particular physical features, and aesthetic, desires, aspirations, in order to be recognized for recapture, to be replunged into non-person. From here then, out of this reluctant yet eager biography, the description of a person arose unexpectedly briefly but luminously as autobiography of the person. How the fugitives fashioned themselves, their physical appearance, their scars attesting to resistance, to incarceration, their personal histories, their intentions, their aspirations, their self-regard appear. An image emerges, a particular face and also a hermeneutic ripped away from the narrative of slavery. This hermeneutic erupts as the perpetrators strain to give their petitions against the fugitives force and jurisdiction. Reading diacritically, we receive a message sent. We retrieve an anticipated freedom, an anticipated life. We find the poem, the self-constructed, the futurist life, the heat and waiting life. So, this one. Can we go back? So, this, so I, I began to sort of read these ads, but then to read the ad. Yeah? To realize that, in fact, these people who put out these ads had to describe people <laughs> in order to recapture people, in order to plunge them back into slavery, into non-people. Yeah? And so I redacted all of the, the ad and tried to find the person who was leaving with intention. And so this was a family, two brothers, Jupiter and Robin, and their mother, Dinah. And Jupiter was an insurrectionist, an insurgent, and a preacher. And he left with his brother and his mother. And you see what they took? A fine new linen shirt, a bare skin, a great coat. And they were going somewhere. You know, we, we talk about running away. They weren't running away, they were going to something. They were actually going with intention and purpose, someplace. And they collected their family and they left. <laughs> I, I just found it fascinating. So keep going, keep going. Um, June is a woman and she is skilled. And she's been trying to leave for a long time since she was 10, right? She took her winter clothing with her. She's a free being. She's skilled. Check out, check out her winter clothing. I've known her to start Virginia Clark down. Yeah? Uh, Peter. I love what he is with. Look, a white Virginia, waist cloth and pedicle, a plaid gown, and then he leaves with his wife's belongings too, because he's going to meet her. 
right? And then he carried a gun of uncommon large size. I love that one. <laughs> right? Like, he knows he has to defend himself also. Yeah? Uh, and a fiddle. Like, that is, that's people hoping to be in a life. You know what I mean? He takes a fiddle and a gun. I, I like that. You know, there are these um, woodcuts of the, the poet in Chinese opera. And the, the poet is always like armed, lots of weapons, right? a pen too, but lots of like daggers and swords and knives. And this reminded me of that. And this, this, this is from Nova Scotia. And there's a girl, and her name is Thursday. And she has left in a red petticoat and a red gown with a red ribbon in her hair. Come on now. Where do you go dressed like that? <laughs> you are going to a life. Right? You are going to like, I am. You know, we, we, we think of it now in, in different ways, and we are correct. But, but, if, but look, deep, look a little again, look at, at what people expected, their expectations, their ambitions are also in there. And those people who wrote those that have to write those expectations and ambitions in, they are forced to write those expectations and ambitions in. Yeah? Because you can't do a generalized kind of a, of a description of someone. You have to do a very specific one, and therefore you have to enliven that body with, with those hopes. Yeah? Anyway, I love that red coat, that red coat. Uh, this is also Sylvia Hamilton's um, installation, uh, uses also that pattern. Where else am I? There's, there's another one that I want to. Walton. Uh, Walton. Like he's 23, right? But he has this incredible sartorial concentration. Look, you know, he has a coat, a velvet cap, a hat, everything else suitable. Right? He has two suits of clothing, one Russian green, one. I mean, like, you know, he's going out looking really good, right? Like I, I just. I kept reading these things and thinking, these people are going to a life, you know? They're, they have intentions of, of living that life, yeah? Um, yeah, so Walter, and which, which is the next one I have? Oh, I love, I love this guy, because he has an old bay horse, an iron pot, a narrow axe, a handsaw, and a smooth ball cut. Yeah. And he's attempting to invade away other people. <laughs> you know, he's, he's going to build a community. He's armed, dangerous. He has a horse. He's efficient, and he plan. He has plans for a community. Right. And then lastly, Jenny. Very fond of singing hymns, and he went off by the name of James Williams. So he solidifies himself in two names. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I wanted to think about how to read these things again, how to read the life that's buried in them, the ambitions and uh, you know, the thoughts of, of, of those people that, that had to be reintroduced in order to recapture them. Yeah. So, to continue. We are in the age of nerves. The author quotes in reply, yes, Vicente we go from then. Here he is, here he is, the clerk sues. Estamos en el ciclo de los nervios. This is closer, the author breathes. <coughs> Inventa mundos nuevos y cuida tu palabra. So the clerk goes on with her humming. Violet toll roads, freezing violet. Museums of Blue, Violet Turbines, Blue Beezers. This is from the Temblores Sierra by Vicente Vidova. Why do you talk like that? Where did you get that voice? It is evening on the wall. Crepuscular, as in Thelonious Monk's Crepus School finale. I collect it, said the author, gathered from everything. From the walks to and from school, past funeral homes, past 
dumpsters, past cane fields, past ladies selling flour. From gazing, from listening, kicking surf, being tumbled in sand, being cut with nails and broken shells, from running barefoot on hot asphalt, from quarrels in noisy bars and suicidal choir, past gloom with sugar, past trees with a range of leaves, pierced ears, with sour cherries in the throat, wasps, ants, scraping ice on the windscreen past water, cutlasses, sewers after Wednesday, after spoons. When sleeping, I collected the end of breathing, then salt, then oranges, light switches, from funeral bars, from cemeteries, from little streets, past long grazer grass, fever grass, brilliant muscles, oil and sweat, from water, from hearing. Banana quits, mostly, from the loneliest, most poisonous smell of cestrum nocturnum, from the sound of shaved ice with red syrup, bottles, broken bottles, green broken bottles, cane shells, peppers, stop. Why? You and your endless list. Why? I don't fully know I must die. Why don't we take it on the face of it? Lists exist, and they may be consecutive or serial or alternative. On the other hand, they may be important as exquisite objects on their own or as an alternate spelling of everything. As you say, I thought you would like the idea of lists. To continue then, why do you speak that way? Because of water. The reef out there, the fregata magnificent. Look at the boiling turquoise, the sea's albumen. Get the throat filled with thick reeds, drown fine pebbles because it stares, radiant, the way corn is disappearing, steep terraces, graphene teat. On the cold walls and the stringy aortas, a thousand musics, it is morning on the wharf. The author has gone on this way well into the night, and now it is morning. The author and the clerk spoke in their sleep. At times, nouns were hunted by prepositions, followed by an adjective. They sat up suddenly like the dead, then lay down with the anxiety of the thought that they were alive, after all. The dark creaked, the papers bloomed with blue letters. Their sleep was jittery sleep, the jittery sleep of birds. They had long arms, long, long arms, if only. Alphabets were used up and used up and lay flat and slumped and disheveled of their normal shapes. It's useless to speak any other way, the author says, in a morning voice. Useless, said the clerk. The night passed in more nouns. Thank you very much.